as I said, uh, that song, as I knew we were going to be singing that, was running through my mind this week as I read, saw pictures of some of the things taking place, and uh, just a lot going on this week. I was getting uh, phone calls from Reverend Janga, who is the leader of the EC Church in Nepal. He's actually in Calcutta, India. He's getting surgery. I said that we would be praying for him. He has a kidney issue, and this kidney issue is creating a blockage, and uh, he cannot get the type of surgery he needs in his own country. He had to go to India to make that happen. And so I can't remember if he was flying or they were taking a train there, but um, he's there now, and he should be getting surgery now, if not now in the very near future. And I'd appreciate if you would be praying for him for his recovery uh, this week as we pray for him in his surgery this morning. Um, just... Uh, uniting as brothers and sisters in Christ and lifting him up before the throne. He and his wife, Mercy, went. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not like here you just go to one of the hospitals around. There's plenty of them, and you get the surgery that you need. It's just a lot more difficult to do that where he is. And, you know, I just never know exactly what kind of hospital he's going to be at and uh, what kind of care he's going to get. That's why he did go to Calcutta, which is a larger city in India. Uh, but if you would remember him in your prayers, I would appreciate that. Also, Diane O'Neill's aunt is in the hospital. Um, it was taken Friday. She is not responsive right now. Diane's aunt is 96 years old, and so um, the outcome, we're not sure, but it doesn't look great. Uh, so if you'd remember uh, Diane's Aunt Betts and Diane and her family and Dave Casey and his family, members of the church, uh, I know they would appreciate that as well. Uh, as I've been sharing too, just a lot of fall ministries coming up and uh, lots going on at Grace, lots of opportunities to be involved. And if you would just be praying for those fall ministries, I would really appreciate it. A lot of people put a lot of work into that, and a lot of people using their gifts that God gives them to help others go deeper in their faith and just try and connect our church so that it is Grace Church family. It's not just a cliche I say. I, I do want it to be that, and our fall ministries are a way in which that happens, whether it's through the life groups or the Bible studies or the mops ministry or the connection groups that happen on Sundays. It's just trying to be in each other's lives. And, and being able to encourage each other, pray for each other. Um, some in the life groups doing Bible studies together and uh, keeping each other accountable that way to be in God's Word and that kind of thing. So I would appreciate if you would uh, just use some time this week to be in prayer for the fall ministries that are going to be happening. So before we open up God's Word, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God, I'm thankful for the people that are here this morning, whether in this church or watching via live stream and thankful that uh, they just decided to spend some time with you and together like this in a church. Lord, we know that doing things like this doesn't happen all over our world, and so we count it a privilege uh, to be able to drive from our homes to come to this place and to gather together in Jesus' name to worship you. God, we're thankful for the things that we've just sang about of who you are and who we are in light of you. God, the forgiveness of sin that we have through your Son, Jesus. The new life that is offered to us in His name. The promise and the hope of His return. God, thank you for those trustworthy promises that we can rely upon and they're not shifting around us like it seems like this world is so good at doing and shifting and, and moving in directions and just blowing with whichever way the wind goes. God, I am thankful too that you are a God who is big enough to know what's happening in this world, that it's not news to you, Lord, but you're also a God who is intimate enough and intentional enough to be involved in our lives, to care about what's going on in our life so that even as somebody in this room is praying to you and sharing some stuff with you, Lord, you're interested in it. You care about it. God, I, I pray for uh, Diane's Aunt Betts and 
just uh, as she is unresponsive right now, we pray for her and her medical condition, Lord, and thankful that she knows and loves you. And God, praying for Diane as well, who's done a lot to care for her, and uh, for Dave, Casey, and his family as well, and just ask that you would comfort them this morning uh, in, in their time of need. God, I want to pray too for uh, others from Grace Church that have been struggling and just need your touch. I ask that you would, you would do that this morning, that even now as we pray for them, that they might sense your presence there in their life. God, I want to, too, just as we, are, I'm sure, are watching the news on a regular basis with everything going on and hearing about the tragedy of the bombing that took place and the loss of innocent lives and the loss of military personnel, Lord, we just pray for them and their families who are grieving right now this morning. We pray for safety, continued safety as they seek to try and get everyone out that they can. And Lord, we just want to lift that country into your hands. And uh, Lord, I pray too, specifically for the Christian church in Afghanistan that had experienced some freedom. They were able to go to a church and worship together, not be afraid or be threatened to be killed. And that in an instant has changed. And so we pray for them, for their families, God, for your protection and for their continued, wis- their continued witness in that country. God, we are grateful for uh, churches uh, all, ac- all across this globe. I'm grateful for the work of the church of the EC Church of Nepal and for just the sacrifice that Reverend Jang and his wife Mercy have made for the people there that they minister to. Uh, Lord, just the wonderful godly man that he is and godly woman that his wife is and just now with this physical issue that he's, un- he's experiencing, Lord. I know it's taking a toll on him and having to travel such a distance to get surgery and leaving family behind in Nepal and churches and responsibilities as the leader, lots weighing on his mind. God, I pray that you would ease uh, his discomfort. I pray that you would ease his stress. I pray, Lord, that you would touch him and heal his body. I pray, Lord, that whether you do that or use the doctors and nurses there to bring that about, I pray that it would happen, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray too, uh, as we continue to minister here in our county, in our community, and as this fall we begin some ministries that are endeavoring to help people get connected with each other and go deeper with you, Lord, I pray that you would be with the leaders who are going to be guiding those groups and uh, ministering to those groups. I pray for the groups themselves as we continue to live out this Christian life and continue to journey with you and have you deepen our faith and challenge us, strengthen us, stretch us in ways, encourage us, keep us accountable, Lord. God, ultimately help us to be conformed into the image of your Son, that we can bear witness to what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this world. We pray in His name. Amen. This morning... Um, I'm kind of categorizing last Sunday, this Sunday, and next Sunday into um, kind of what can we do as the church in our current context, and the culture in which we find ourselves, and the, the issues of the day, the things happening uh, in our world, not just our world, but our schools, and uh, in our all of our institutions, everything that's taking place, how do we as the Christian church respond? And last Sunday, we talked about school. It was back to school Sunday. Lots of people went back to school this week, if not this week, or last week, I mean, if not last week, probably this week. And I shared with you, I was just being uh, telling you personally what's going on in my family, that Jess and I have decided to do homeschooling. And uh, that was, as I shared, not because we were dissatisfied with Schuylkill Haven. We appreciated the teachers, the administration there. They did a great job. It was more because of what God was doing in our life and within our family. And as I said, there are a few other families within Grace Church doing the same thing. And I invited you, if you have questions about it, to come talk to me. And, And the big picture of all that was because I wanted to take even more seriously than I have been to train my children in what it means to fear the Lord, 
Now, we talked about what that means. Of course, it's not terrified, but what it means to live life in light of the reality of Christianity, because Christianity is not simply a religion of personal salvation. Yes, that's a part of Christianity, Jesus saving us. Though we stood condemned, now we have experienced forgiveness. That is true. But Christianity is not simply a religion about personal salvation. Christianity is an explanation to the story of the world. The Bible is telling us a story about the world and everything in it. And so if we want to understand the world, what's really real, then Christianity, I believe, is the best explanation for that and is the best explanation for operating as a society or civilization. And I shared with you my own personal feelings that at times I wake up and I think civilization is coming apart at the seams. What can I, some nobody from Schuylkillhaven, do about that? And part of what God was putting on my heart and Jess's heart was to train up our children in the way they should go, whether that's college, not college, family, whatever it looks like, their life is centered around Jesus. And we felt we wanted to make that an everyday kind of thing for us. So I categorized that last Sunday with schooling and the importance of teaching the generation, then generation after that generation, then the next generation, all about God and His ways. And so I'm saying that same thing about the image of God in marriage. I talked about the image of God many Sundays ago. I can't remember which Sunday it was, but I was sharing with you why that's important, and we cannot lose that, that truth as we live out our faith in this world and in the current culture. So my hope this morning is to to share with you another piece of how do we turn things around? How do we change the way things are going? And my answer to that for us is in my children and making sure that generation is ready to face the challenges of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And my other answer to that is, We need to recapture, rebuild the importance of marriage and how marriage itself is actually a reflection of the image of God. And so I want to remind us this morning about what I mean when I say the image of God. It's not like we're looking at a reflection in the mirror. If you remember what I said, and if you don't, I will remind you so you're in luck, When a king conquered a land in the ancient Near Eastern world, they would create an image, carve it out of stone, out of wood, whatever, and they would set it up in that conquered land, and that image, that statue, would bear the image of that king, and so you were reminded every time you walked through town square and saw that image of who was in charge in this territory, in this land. That king, though he was not present, had rulership and authority over you. That is the language that's being used in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And that image of God's rule and reign and authority on earth is us. That's why in the Ten Commandments it says, you shall not create for yourself an idol. You're not supposed to make any idols. No other image, because I've already done it, God says. It's you. If you make some other kind of image, it's fake. It's nothing. You are my image on earth. You represent the rule and the reign of God on planet earth. That's just how God decided to set it up. And it was good. It was going really great for about two chapters. And then Genesis chapter 3, things kind of took a turn for the worse. But you and I are God's symbol. We are the ones saying God still rules and reigns on this earth. And the fact that we are His image bearers is telling that to planet earth. And when Jesus came, He said, I'm coming with an invading kingdom. 
I'm coming to reclaim what is already mine. The kingdom of God is at hand, is what Jesus says. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is all kind of image-bearing language that is being used there. And that's all set up in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so understanding the importance of mankind, male and female, you and I are God's royal representatives. In the New Testament, the language is, you are an heir to the throne. You are going to inherit the kingdom. That's what Jesus is telling us. And your presence and my presence on earth is reminding the world who rules and reigns this place. And at times it looks like I'm not really sure we are doing that. But Jesus' kingdom was not one that he was coming with an invading army to conquer. He was doing it through, read Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. It was going to look different, Jesus' invading kingdom. But a part of what God was doing in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 was creating the building blocks necessary for a thriving, flourishing, healthy life and society. Society is simply a group of people together doing life together. Culture is neither positive or negative. Human beings create culture. Culture is neutral. You can work at a job and have a great culture at that job, and you can work at a different job and the culture be dreadful. And maybe it's in the same company. And you just moved from Pennsylvania to Kansas. Well, it's the same company. Why are the cultures different? Because culture is made by people. It's a group of people who decide the norms and values that they're going to live by, and that's what they're going to follow. And so God put that in place. If, if the mandate was to rule on His behalf, that's what Genesis 1 is telling us to do, if just to remind you in Genesis chapter 1, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them, male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. You will have dominion in this place. You're going to be my representative to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and I'm going to bless you. That was the mandate. Now, so how did God decide to do that? What's the best way to bear His image to show that God's rule and reign is on this earth and to do exactly what He said, to uh, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. How did God decide to do that? Well, that's chapter 2. This is God's way of doing that on planet earth. This is just how it works. This is why Christianity is not just a religion of personal salvation. It tells you what is really real, the way things really are. For the earth to work the way it's supposed to work and life work the way it's supposed to work, God says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. And now what I have up on the screen for you is verse 19 through the end of that chapter. And this is how God has decided to do that. To bless, to increase in number, fulfill the earth and subdue it. How are things going to operate on planet Earth? God says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. And He brought them to the man to see what He would name them. And whatever the man called each living, each living creature, that was its name. And that was, in ancient Near Eastern culture, your ability to name something showed your dominion over it, your power over it. And so he was again saying, you are going to rule over all the stuff I created. So all these creatures are coming before Adam. 
but none of them seemed to be suitable for him. It says in verse 20, So the man gave, an, gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. God is orchestrating all this. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is now, or other translations will translate instead of this is now, this is at last. Like, finally, this is at last. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, that leaving is not like we go and move to the next town over. Some people do that in marriage. In the ancient New Eastern culture, you didn't. You actually stayed in your father's household. That's why when you hear the story about Jacob, all of his sons are still there. They're all living there. This leaving is one of clinging to or your obligation, your fidelity, your loyalty, your allegiance transfers from this family to this person that God gives you. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. What we call that is marriage. That's what marriage is. This transfer of allegiance from your family to this person, and you actually become a new family. You become one flesh. It's actually like a different organism forms and is created. It's almost like the DNA of this couple is different from this one. That's how big of a transition that it is. And verse 25 is simply a transition to chapter 3. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And chapter 3 changes all that, and changes everything, really. Changes this relationship that was God-given, God-ordained for the benefit of mankind and all of creation. So in reality, what is happening here is God is creating a relationship that is going to bear His image. We are being image-bearers of God, communicating His rule and reign on the earth through marriage. Through this relationship we call marriage, we are bearing His image. God has now spelled out from Genesis 1 in the fact that He breathed life into the human beings. They're different than all the other animals. Genesis 1 is, and we get to the human creation, God is highlighting the climactic point in all of creation. It's all pointing to this point in which He creates male and female. The role and relationship of man and woman is spelled out in Genesis 2. What, what they're supposed to do. How are we going to increase and fill the earth and subdue it? And how is God going to bless us? He's going to do that through marriage through this man and woman He created. This unity and interdependence in this relationship. This relationship, God is trying to give us an idea of the type of relationship we're called to have with Him. I mean, Paul uses the language of bride and groom for church and Jesus. We just sang about that. That's how intimate this relationship's supposed to be, this interdependence, this unity that we're supposed to have, despite the fact that we are different. God created them male and female. We have differences. And as much as our culture tries to say we don't and we're all the same, we all know we have differences. Scientifically, we can prove it. I have a different set of chromosomes than Jess has. Biology, anatomy, it's pretty obvious. God's made us different. Not only that, but He's just made us different in how we're wired. I don't know if you've ever read the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. No? No one's read that? Okay, some of you read in here. Good. 
It's pretty obvious. Men and women are different. It's, it's really not that hard to figure out. But somehow, in our differences, God brings this unity and interdependence. And when we stand in front of our friends and family, our community and God, and profess these obligations to one another, that's what we're talking about. God is creating this relationship that though you are different, and I've got two weddings I'm doing in October, and one of the first things I do in my premarital counseling is I do a personality assessment. And one of the th- first things you're going to discover in that personality assessment is you are different and how you're wired. You just are. It's not good or bad, it's just different. But somehow God brings this these differences together in this relationship and says, these are the building blocks for all of society. This is how I'm going to accomplish the mandate of filling the earth, increasing the number and subduing it. They are of the same substance when Adam says, this at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That little poem that's there in Genesis 1 is simply highlighting, underscoring, putting in bold print the unity that is found in the human family. The building blocks of how you're going to make this thing work in this world, God says, is through marriage. Because it's in marriage that we bear God's image. God creates And he has decided that in this relationship of husband and wife, they too can create new life. This amazing, beautiful thing that God has done in giving life to human beings. God gives us a part in that. He enables us to create life. This beautiful thing. We are doing what God has called us to do in that. And that's why it's so important. That's why Jesus makes a big deal about it. In Matthew and Mark, when he's approached about marriage and divorce and things like that. In Israel, what I've just read for you is how they decided to organize their society. Ancient Israel organized around this fundamental principle, the origins of family. And so... When we see the mess take place in Genesis 3, where brokenness enters in, and we we all know that, lots of broken families out there. That's not God's original intention. And it gets so bad that God is grieved. It doesn't say in Genesis 6 that God is angry. It says God is grieved. It breaks His heart to see what has become of human beings. And we have the flood account, the flood story. And then... Noah and his family get out, and they start doing the mandate again and fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it, bear my image on it. And by the time you get to Genesis 11, here we go again, Tower of Babel, what's God going to do? God scatters the people all over earth. In Genesis 12, we find out whether or not God's finished with humanity. Is He all done? Has he given up and he's thrown his hands up in the air and said, oh, geez, I can't work with these people anymore. We're introduced to a family, Abram and Sarai. And we start following a family around as God begins to write his story of redemption. The family is essential to all that God is doing. Israel knew that. Jesus, when he's challenged about divorce, points back to this account in Genesis and says what God has said when he made male and female, and for this reason a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife in this relationship that he's talking about, let no man separate, let nothing divide this relationship. Jesus, I think, said that because he was simply reiterating what God already knew, that the family is the bedrock to the survival of any society. 
when you begin to see families break apart and the family system break down, you begin to see societies fall apart. And when all of that gets confused, it can get really ugly and really bad. And so Jesus is simply saying that because God knows the reality of what happens to broken families, God hates divorce. Marriage and family are the divine ideal in carrying out the mandate of creation. But we live in a broken world, and Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees is really trying to make sure they understand, as was the case in Jesus' day, many people, men specifically, were getting certificates of divorce for, like, she burned the toast today, so I'm going to get a certificate for divorce. And it was being abused and misused, and Jesus says, it's not like Moses was commanding you that you did this. You know, she looked at you funny yesterday, and so now you don't like her quite as much. Well, I guess we should get divorced. That's not what Moses was saying. He was permitting something that was taking place because of the reality that sin and fallenness has entered our world, and marriages aren't exempt from that. But that doesn't mean we, as the church, shouldn't advocate for and point people to the ideal for marriage. I've had people come in my office that have already had kids. They've got families already, and now this is becoming a new family. When I did my brother's wedding, he had a daughter, and his now wife had two daughters. I've had people come to my office that have had bad experiences. Maybe they haven't been divorced necessarily, but they've had previous relationships where they've lived together. We call that cohabitating. I've had them across the board in my office. I didn't say, sorry, I'm not going to do your wedding for you because you're imperfect and that's not what God wants in marriage. Good luck out there. No, I think God is able to redeem marriage. I think He's able to bring from brokenness something beautiful. And I use that imagery for my own brother's wedding of a mosaic, of all this broken glass that is just shattered and all over the ground. And a mosaic is taking these broken shards of glass or something like that and putting them all together and creating this beautiful picture. That's what God does in relationships. Yes, He hates divorce, but that doesn't mean He can't redeem a marriage relationship. I think God is interested in doing that because He knows what happens with the breakdown of family. And I think we as the church, and something I do with every couple, I have premarital counseling that you have to go through that if I'm going to do your wedding because it's my opportunity to talk about something beautiful that God did. I think that's what marriage is supposed to be. I know not everybody's is like that, and maybe you've experienced something different, but I'm telling you that's not God's design. God's heart in marriage is that we bear His image in it. And this kind of relationship that He wants us to experience is what marriage is all about. And so if anybody ought to be the champions of marriage, it ought to be us, the church. We ought to be the, the best encourager for that couple that's struggling. We ought to be willing to fork out as much money as it takes to get them into good counseling. We ought to be willing to bend over backwards to try and help them restore this thing that God brought together for the sake, really, of society. For the sake of the fact that we, through marriage, are bearing witness bearing God's image on earth. That's been challenged in a lot of ways nowadays, this idea of marriage and the way in which and the things in which people get divorced over. 
And I was reading a commentary, um, a Breakpoint is an organization, I mentioned him before, Chuck Colson's organization. Uh, John Stone Street is the guy's name that leads that now, and he wrote a book with Sean McDowell, which is Josh McDowell's son. Josh McDowell was a very famous preacher who was also did a lot in apologetics or defending the faith and that kind of thing. And and John Stone Street and Josh McDowell wrote a book about marriage specifically on how does the church respond to the current issue of same-sex marriage. And, and how do we deal with that? How do we handle that? And John had some difficult things to say because he said, we've already kind of lost that battle back in the 1970s when we had a thing called no-fault divorce enter into common parlance, and we didn't make a huge deal about divorce. Again, not that God can't redeem it, but it still ought to pain us when we see it happen. And God has brought some beautiful things out of broken pieces when people have been willing to submit their lives and their marriages back to Jesus. And all those different couples coming to my office, they hear that from me every time. But something John said in that commentary that he wrote made me think about the importance of we as the church being advocates for what marriage really is all about. And he wrote this, and they talk about this in their book about marriage, He says, what makes or breaks marriage nowadays, it seems like, what makes or breaks it, whether it's same-sex marriage or straight marriage, is the intensity of attraction. If I don't feel as attracted to this person, maybe we shouldn't be married. If I don't have the same feelings for you that I did three years ago, maybe we shouldn't be married. And what he is saying is that has kind of erased the purpose, design, and meaning of marriage, and marriage is now about the intensity of attraction to another person. And he says this, marriage has, in many ways, become a government registry for sexual friendships. That's what marriage seems like it's become. We let the government know we've gotten married. And then three years from now, we'll let the government know that we're not married. And so it's more about sexual friendships as opposed to lifelong committed relationship. I mean, that's the only definition for marriage. And so our children and their, their children are going to watch us and see what marriage is all about. And, and I think marriage has way more implications than just my family. I've seen what broken marriages do to family. It's, it's been a part of my family. Not my parents who've been married for 51 years, but siblings. I've seen it. I've sat in my office with people who have talked to me about the brokenness, and it, it's devastating, it's heartbreaking. But I want to suggest to you that it has even more profound implications on a society itself. And so I want to encourage you, if you are struggling in your marriage, please, please come talk to me. Please talk to somebody that can help you in counseling. Counseling is great. Good counseling is great. Unfortunately, there's bad counselors out there that aren't going to help. I had a conversation Two weeks ago, a good friend of mine knows somebody uh, that is, he's friends with, that this guy's wife, they have two kids, this guy's wife has said, I really think we should have an open marriage. That means that we should be able to be sexually active with other people other than you, my husband. And studies are showing that that's healthy. You can read experts that say, hey, that's a good thing. So make sure you're going to good counseling because there's people out there that could care less about marriage. And it seems like we live in a culture that makes marriage all about the way I feel today as opposed to this lifelong commitment that I've made 
that I've changed my obligations to you. My allegiance is to you and you alone. And that ends when we die. If you are a person who is struggling, know someone who is struggling, please be an encourager to them. Help them. Walk through that with them. Come and talk to me. If you are a person that has experienced God's redemption through marriage, as I know some of you have, use that story and something that is broken. We know that that happens within families. But when God gets involved, it can be redeemed and it can be restored. And something beautiful actually results from it. This maybe seems like something easy. Oh, yeah, okay, we should just have a stronger marriage. I honestly believe that if we do, if we start building on marriages now, we actually will be able to turn things around. If not the entire world, at least your family and my family and maybe this community and a generation of children who grow up having three dads because that was a stepdad, this was a stepdad, now they're with someone else, a couple of moms, not sure who the aunts and uncles are. I got all these siblings. I'm not sure who's actually related to me. There's a lot of confusing things happening in children's lives. God's design, God's intention, God's purpose for marriage is about creation itself. It's about building a bedrock in which societies can flourish and grow. And I think that starts with us seeing the fact that your marriage, my marriage, is, is an image bearer. We are bearing God's image. We are saying, this is God's. And we're going to show that through the way we live because He's brought this relationship into being. We call it marriage. We as the church need to be advocates for it. Encourage those who are struggling. And as I said, I think God created this for something special and beautiful, and fulfilling, and enriching. And if that doesn't describe your marriage, don't be satisfied with the status quo. Do something to change it. That starts by giving it over to God and asking God to do something in your life and in your marriage. And in that way, I think we'll be able to turn some things around. Let's pray. God, I'm grateful for the many uh, wonderful witnesses of what marriage is to be all about here at Grace Church. I'm thankful for my own parents and their marriage of 51 years. Thankful for my own marriage, Lord, and just all that you've done through bringing Jess into my life and God, I believe that Genesis is the way we are called to live. I believe that what Jesus said is, is how we should operate as the church. And God, this morning, I just want to pray for the marriages that are struggling right now. I just want to pray for anyone here at Grace Church, whether in this room or watching. If they're struggling, Lord, I just want to ask that you'd be with them. God, I want to thank You for the promise of redemption, the promise of restoration in marriage. I want to thank You for the relationships that You have restored and the broken pieces that You have put together to create just this beautiful picture. Only You can do that, God. And I believe as we continue to believe that and live that out and bear witness to that, God, those kinds of stories, those kinds of lives aren't going to be able to stop the gospel from going forward. God, help us to live in a way that does bear witness to who Jesus is, that You are the one who rules and reigns on this earth, 
And God, that happens in our marriages as husband and wife. God, may we see your blessing in our lives as we help to restore and rebuild the importance of what marriage is. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.